Welcome. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for coming to the house. Yeah. I mean, how? I mean, you you approach the end of this run now. How do you feel? Really good, man. It was like a a lot of work getting the show up. Um, it's like probably the most ambitious production we've ever done. And playing, we're kind of playing in the round, kind of boxing rink in the middle of the yeah. arena. And so it's it's just like a lot more work because you're like kind of working the whole room. Um, but very, very satisfying. We've had some of our best show, like our show in Vancouver was like by far the best show we've ever done there. Like, uh, like just cities that we haven't typically had amazing shows of like even like Boston and um, we had an amazing show in San Diego, which was like, what? Like, <laughs> what is going on? What makes an amazing show? It's just an energetic thing, you know? It's like, um, it's kind of like a feedback loop between you and the audience and like they kind of give you something, you give it back and it kind of escalates. You know? So do you remember, you're the kind of guy that remembers where you had bad shows or not excellent shows? You don't remember the bad ones. They kind of fade away. Um, it's pretty amazing though. It's like, I think collectively we can remember most of the details about like the first three years of the band, like every little dive bar we ever played, like that stuff is super vivid. Yeah. And then, um, when you get into like a l bigger rooms, it's like different things that make a show stick out, you know? Yeah. Cause like in the small rooms, it's like, you're in like Iowa City and it's like the weird gas station that you stopped at with the, with the, you know, like some weird experience you have that kind of makes it stick out. And then um, in the bigger rooms, it's more like an energetic thing. Yeah. You have, by all accounts, the best band in the world. When did you feel, do you feel that way? Um, yeah, maybe for rock bands, yeah. 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 When did you feel like you got there? Um, well, we were... By the time we made Funeral, we were a really great band. I mean, we had been going for a while. Um, but there were a lot of other bands really at the peak of their powers at the same time. I mean, even like the White Stripes and the Strokes and, um, you know, there were like a lot of other really great bands. And, you know, you kind of look around and there's not too many of them that are still yeah. going, you know what I mean? The, the bands that we really that we really loved and respected right. coming out of it, you know, or they are, it's just like have had different lulls and valleys and stuff like that. We're in a pretty amazingly fortunate position. How much work goes into making this particular record? How many songs did you have written? Um, probably hundreds. I mean, we, which is insane, right? For like most singers can't do that. Or writers. It, it's a stupid amount of work that goes into making a record. Every time For Arcade Fire, you yeah. kinda it's kinda like having a child, you kinda block it out. <laughs> you know, I think biologically you just block it out so you can do it again. Yeah. Um yes, yeah, it's, it's an insane amount of work. Yeah. You sit by yourself and write a bunch of stuff? I mean, Regina and I collaborate. I mean, usually one of us is in the other room if someone's coming up with something. Yeah. Um Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's sort of like a Lennon McCartney sort of scenario. Yeah. Or it gets kind of blurry sometimes, who came up with what or whatever. But I, I write a lot of lyrics alone. Yeah. Do you, you know, what you want out of it, has that changed as a songwriter? Um, what do you mean? You know, this idea when you're, when you're first starting something, first few years, there's a lot of work that goes into building momentum, even though if you're not conscious of it, it's just you're building something. Yeah. And then once you've built something, you know inside that you still have to build to maintain it. Yeah. But it's different because now you're building on top of something that's there and that has an audience and that has muscle memory, that has, you know, things that people like in you, things that you like, but maybe you, you're a different person. You'd seen the world differently than you would have. 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've never even, I don't think we would know how to repeat ourselves if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, there's a term in, like when I was in, I studied um, scriptural interpretation at McGill, and there's this term in theology called negative theology, which basically means you can't say anything about God, but you can say what God isn't. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's, I think it's kind of like that with songwriting. You're like, not that, not that, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. Well, one of the challenges with that kind of interpretation and that yeah. kind of philosophy is it can drive you crazy. Well, you, the thing is, you kind of know when it's there. Yeah. And by a process of reduction, by like removing it, what's not there. You know? Right. Yeah. Are you a happy person, you think, generally? Um, yeah, I mean, I... I was pretty depressed in high school because I went to boarding school when I was 15 and it was, you know, my family was in Houston and I was in New Hampshire and it was extremely stimulating and intellectually amazing. And some of my really closest friends I, I still met there it was like a really, the student body was super interesting, but it was, you know, really crying myself to sleep a lot, being away from home. And I, that's kind of really when I started playing the guitar and, and I never really learned, I think Free Fallin' by Tom Petty was like the only song I actually learned how to play on the guitar. <laughs> Good I, song. Like one guitar lesson. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> Got this. And then my roommate and I would write these kind of like funny, like we'd kind of like pretend like it was a joke just as a defense mechanism, I yeah. think like that. But we would kind of make all these four track recordings, just tons and tons and tons of them. But we were so passionate about it but pretended like the whole thing was a joke kind of um but that was that's always been my my kind of crutch if i ever feel low or anything like it's kind of the only thing that helps really to it's, write it's just pl you know playing and kind of trying to say exactly how you feel and then it kind of releases something did you feel when you went to born did you were young, but did you feel like, was it abandoned you felt? Did you feel pushed away? Like, what was that? What's that conversation No, like? it was kind of a choice. Um, like, my, my high school in Houston uh, was like a thousand kids. And the year after my freshman year, they merged four high schools for the football team to make this, like, super high school. Like so it's like wow. four or 5,000 students. And they misjudged how many students there were, so they couldn't even fit all four grades in the building that they built. And so it was going to be just like 5,000 students, 10th to 12th grade. Oh, my God. And it's like this building looked like a prison. <laughs> and I was already pretty, like, I couldn't have put my finger on it, but I already did not have much in common with most of yeah. the people I was growing up with in Houston. I was like kind of, I wouldn't have known that there was something else, but my dad had gone to this this really great boarding school and I applied and I got in and they're like, my, uh, my dad's parents were very austere about money. And like, like you wouldn't think that they had any money. Just my grandpa wore the same white t-shirt every day, but they always saved money for education. So I had the opportunity to, to go and yeah. So it wasn't like they sent me away, right. you know what I mean? But it still was like, all you have is other students. It's right. like you and know, it's like a bunch of fifteen year olds, like very like kind of Lord of the Flies sort of scenario. But right. And well to sink or swim in that scenario is yeah. pretty challenging. Yeah. Right. But ultimately it like so much of what I'm into, I got turned on to there. Like it really couldn't have been another way. But um, right. like what, what what were the big realizations you had there musically? Oh man. I just had this like kind of beyond amazing English teacher, um, this guy Fred Tremolo, that was a beatnik who had, he was like friends with Fernand Getty and Allen Ginsberg and stuff like that. And he had been in World War II, he was a spy. He, so he spoke like 13 languages and, um, and he was, he basically had tenure. So he just taught whatever he felt like teaching. Like, yeah, I was 15 and like, one day we'd watch like Brazil by Terry Gilliam. And then the next day he'd read us the wasteland by T.S. Eliot, like with all the languages. And then he'd like make us read like a 1500 page, like Don DeLillo book that came out that week, just cause that's what he was reading. It was just like so much, so beyond my capacity to understand, but like, but that's an amazingly progressive way to approach education. It was amazing. And, and basically it was a writing, a writing class, like, you read and you wrote and basically we read all this stuff called sudden fiction, which is basically like you have to have a beginning, middle and an end and it has to mm -hmm. be done in one page. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we would write these like really short 
condensed like short fiction and it was just like the best way possible to learn how to write you know what i mean so that's in your songwriting today yeah exactly i mean songwriting is even to me more like filmmaking or short story telling where it's like even more condensed but then you have the music which is like the most powerful evocative thing you could possibly have you know um so yeah but then he he my senior year I got into this kind of special writing class that he was a teacher of and he uh I came to class and my my friend Josh Rothman who's now a writer for the New Yorker like the kids in this class were so smart you know what I mean like I I was the alternate like I didn't get in a kid got kicked out and I got in so I knew I was like the 15th best writer in this class you know what I mean like and everyone was so much smarter than me and I remember like we came to class and he had this big scarf on. It was like kind of fall and he was like, had a cold or flu and he went to the doctor to get checked out and he had lung cancer oh my and God. was given a week to live basically. So, so like our whole class like went to his hospital bed basically. And he like wrote, he literally wrote my college recommendations from his deathbed like I still have one somewhere. It's like a paragraph long and it's like, to whom it may concern, <laughs> I just oh, found man. out that I have a week to live. So I'm going to make this brief. And he was like, it was kind of the beginning of hypertext and web stuff. And he was really into that. So he yeah. made up all this crap about how I was really like, like wins like the new bard of hypertext and like a genius. And you should let him into your school and just wrote this absurd college recommendation, you know? That's um, why. And then, like, I spoke at his funeral at the at the school, so it was pretty intense. Wow. Yeah. Did you get into those schools? Uh, I didn't get into. I got into the Sarah Lawrence College, yeah. which is like this very progressive kind of make your own major sort of art school. Um, but but yeah, I didn't. My grades. I had really good standardized test scores, but like pretty bad grades. Pretty bad grades. Yeah. That's an intense story about you. Yeah, it was intense. And I mean, then the other thing is like in the dorms, so like I had an older friend that actually, the first iteration of Arcade Fire that I started with him, um, this guy, Jessen, and there were these older kids in my dorm and I could just go to the room and I would just take their CDs, you know, so like I got really into The Cure and Echo and the Bunny Man and New Order and Joy Division and all these kind of British bands, like just because there were these older kids that had, yeah, like because I didn't have an older brother, so that's like really my musical taste really came from that. Did people believe in you then as a musician, as an artist? I got pretty good by my senior year. Yeah, like I, I mean, I won like the, I did a there's like a drama competition which I didn't act in a single play the entire time I was at Exeter, mm -hmm. but I wrote like I transcribed a scene from. Um, Dr. Strangelove. Oh my God, like, it's the best movie I ever made. And I did like a duo, like I picked this really weird kid and like the class below me, which is like this really strange looking kid. And like we did a, a duologue of that and like won the like drama competition. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just cause it was, it was like the, the bodily fluids yeah, scene yeah. or whatever, like just like transcribed as oh. a duologue. Did you do it to be a fucker? Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just I just thought it'd be funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just thought it'd be funny. Um, so it, by my senior year, like when I was just taking like photography and film and all that stuff, I really would found really easy. Yeah. Um, I was a decent math student, and then I had one teacher that I didn't like, and I just was horrible. For, like I just zoned out. I was like, forgot about it. I'm done with this. Um, and so then all of a sudden, I'm curious if any of these things pop up on the later records. You know, as you get older, people tend to reflect differently. Yeah. And it, certainly when you're younger, a lot of the writing I read when people are younger, they're looking forward. Right. You get older, they look back a little. Where are you in that? Because I found this record to be reflective, not so much about you, but just reflective in general. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, they're kind of all that way to a certain extent. I mean, I don't know, like tunnels and is a pretty kind of similar setup to everything now, mm -hmm. I find. It's like there's kind of an emotional kernel, but it's it's sort of dystopic and sort of like storytelling and um 
but yeah, I don't know. It might be different. I don't know. Some of the things that, that about dystopia, though, that that I think is so interesting is that as much as it's futuristic, it's always about what it's related to what it used to be like. Right. So everybody connects it to their past in their own way. Yeah. Tell me about just and brief. I know we talked about this only really casually, not on mic once, but I'm so fascinated with how you wrote "Wake Up." Yeah. Um, just lyrically. Lyrically. I mean, that was musically Regine, that was like a piano thing that Regine, like the melody that she'd been playing that um, it's almost like a Chinese, Chinese classical music or something like that. Um, I don't know. I just kind of had this, it was the first thing we'd worked on. The way we played it was really punk and different, but it felt like what I love about a great Motown song. Like it kind of had this in terms of the music, it, like I'm, when we finally we, we put on the strings on that song, like I was just like, that was about the happiest I'd ever been in my life up to that point. Right. Um, Cause it was like that combo. It had that kind of combination. I mean, a song like what becomes the broken heart is like, to me, like one of the greatest compositions of, you know, the modern era where it's like the chords are really kind of sophisticated and interesting. The lyrics are very simple, but very, dark and heartfelt and kind of um it goes back to what you said before you know it what feels it is. a lot singing it now it all of it feels so much more political yeah. now it's crazy it's like particularly playing in the states it's yeah. like never realized the extent to which that was the subtext um but yeah like every night i sing like children wake up yeah. hold your mistake up before they turn the summer into dust yeah. it's like <laughs> it's like literally a concern <laughs> Like a literal concern, you know. This is why I asked because when I saw you play, <laughs> when I saw you play in Halloween, right? I watched the, I watched, and it is literal. I watched you play in Halloween. I thought, yeah, this is it. Like we're on fire. Yeah. You know, the election hadn't happened, but we knew what was coming. Yeah. I'd actually bet on Trump, so I won money on it. Sadly, because yeah. I just felt like that's where, where America was going. Yeah. But it, it's so much worse than we thought it was going to be, and we yeah. thought it was going to be bad. That's what's crazy. And now yeah. when you talk about literal dust, you're like, there could be some real heavy shit going down. Yeah. Do you feel like, as, aside from the fact that human beings need to be engaged as an artist, you have to do something extra now? I mean, yeah, it's something we struggle with a lot. I mean, my brother's been doing these kind of after shows and like kind of local political issues in the U.S. And I mean, I think ultimately it has to be a grassroots thing. It can't really be a top-down thing. Mm -hmm. Um because it doesn't really work, you know? But um, th there's no, like, easy answer. I mean, I think I think the first Obama election was really incredible to be a part of, but I, I was really disappointed in how the country, as soon as he got elected, they're like, we did it. Cool. <laughs> and he's like, okay, so healthcare, like, not our problem. <laughs> like, we did it. You know, it's like, how about we do one fucking thing before we... So like, back. you know, like just one, yeah. Like maybe just like a halfway decent attempt at healthcare. Like, no, we did it. We're cool. Yeah, we're cool. It's Thanks. Like, it's like, wow. Does I it mean, disillusion you? No, I mean, not really. It, that's kind of how it's always been. You know what I mean? But I just think it's, it's kind of hyped right now because I think it's easy for people to share a hashtag of something and get the same little hit of actually doing something mm -hmm. like kind of gives you the emotional hit that you did something with it. Like by literally doing nothing. It's the methadone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like political methadone. Um, but yeah, it's tough. Cause we're like in less, we never been less in physical contact with each other. And it's like all of this stuff happens in, has to happen in the streets and in, like between actual people, you know? Mm -hmm. There's like a Dostoevsky line, he said, uh, when you love people, and it's something I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, if you, when you love people in general, you hate people specifically, you know? Mm -hmm. Like there's, if you like have a feeling of love for in general, generality, it means you hate people. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to apply it to the individual. Yeah. I, I, I or it's, like, it's like a false, it's like a false, uh, 
false love or like not not a real love. You know? I uh, I was lucky enough just before we passed the interview on Berto Echo and we talked about love versus hate and he said that love is the most. He was actually a pretty big, yeah. He was actually a pretty big impact on me in high school reading his stuff. Yeah. He just understood that hate was very generous. Yeah. And love was not. Yeah. And so it was a lot easier for people to think they were being generous because they could just dole hate out so quickly. Yeah. yeah. What an incredible writer. Or yeah. do you read, do you still read a lot now? Do you have time? Um, I, I mean, that's my great luxury. Yeah. Like when I do get time, I do. Are you stuck? Did you change too on the Instagram story game? Did you, people's, all my friends who used to read a lot are fucking memeing out now and their, and their ability to retain information is going away. Yeah. Are you stuck in that trap? Um, not really. It's more just like when I'm traveling, I find I can only read narrative nonfiction when I'm traveling for some reason. Okay. I just can't read fiction. I, I just, my brain just like rejects it. Yeah. It's like, this isn't real. <laughs> Cause it isn't. <laughs> are you just making this up? <laughs> are you reading like Jared Diamond or are you reading biographies? What are you reading? Yeah. It's like that sort of thing. Or like, I, you know, like if there's ever like a new, who's the dude who wrote like into the wild, like. Oh, not the, I'm thinking of the filmmaker. Um, um, not John Kraken. Uh, yeah, Cracker. Yeah, Cracker, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything by him is like the perfect thing to read on tour. A little it's adventurous. Like, it's like super, super poetic, but factual. Yeah. As a songwriter, you could do that and do do that, right? Yeah. It's a poetic storytell, but it's fact. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a mix. But How much of it now, though? Is a mix. Or how much of it is? Is it shifting? I don't know. I couldn't say. I, I, I haven't done that analysis yet. We'll do it. I'll report back to you. Yeah, let me know. Um, the Windows 98 thing. Does, can I? The thing you pulled in LA that I saw at the Echo is one of the greatest moves. Of, it's the greatest move I've ever seen, I think, by a DJ. Yeah. Do you do it everywhere? Will it spoil it if we tell that? Oh, no, it's fine. I, I only did it that one that I did a couple shows on that. Did so Wind's DJing, I think it was the Echo. I think it was somewhere around there. Yeah, something like that. In Silver Lake, and suddenly you come out in a full mirror, or so we thought, full mirror ball costume, mirror ball mask, DJs. It's for a long time. Yeah. I, I think it was about an hour and a half in when I walked up to the to see, because you were DJing, you're off CDJs, and I thought you never did that. But then I looked at your shoes and went, fuck, he would never wear shoes like that. Yeah. But then my friend went, look behind you. And I looked behind, and you were actually just DJing at the back of the room, dressed regularly, yeah. and you had some guy on stage pretending to be you. And for hours, people were taking selfies with you while DJing. You're, whoever was playing, you was super into it. Yeah. And I remember looking over at you, and you just smiled, and I thought, now that is a ballin' move right there. Well, the idea of like looking at someone DJ is, unless it's like Kid Koala or like Grandmaster Flash yeah. or something, it's like not particularly interesting to me. <laughs> So you thought I want to DJ, but I want people to look at me? Well, it just defeats the purpose, particularly if it's like people that are fans of a band. They're coming and they just think it's a show. Like when, okay, Fire fans come to see you. No, I could, I, to me, DJing is like the DJ should be like up in a corner, not seen, and there's a dance floor. And it's like yeah. a, that's like what that thing is. Right. You know, I, or at least the aspect of it that I'm interested in. And so did you, did you take some joy sitting back and watching the whole thing go down? It was down? hilarious. Yeah, it was really funny. Yeah. It was, it was hours, dude, before people clued in. I don't. I think many, many people had no, didn't know at all. <laughs> Do you spend a lot of time on stage thinking about how to deconstruct the role of a rock star with their audience, like in um, the Arcade Fire thing? I mean, we've always been on the opposite tip. You know, it's like we hang out in the audience and watch the opening bands, and we kind of. I don't do photos before. People are pretty cool about it. Mm -hmm. Um. I think you just project, if you just project that you're not into that kind of thing, then it's generally okay. Does it it's kind of like a vampire. It's like once you invite the vampire into your house, then you're kind of stuck with it. But is that what that is to you, giving up that part? I don't know. I mean, I just try to like, I'm pretty good at blocking out, like not worrying too much about people being weird about me, mm -hmm. which happens sometimes, you know, usually like around shows and stuff like that. Like in my day-to-day -day life, it's pretty, pretty normal. Yeah. But but when, when you first started to contend with that, people being weird around you, how was that? It's a trip, but um, Regine's a lot more sensitive to it. Like, she really hates it. Um, I I found that my mechanism was just to, you know, it's just like background noise, really. You yeah. know, it doesn't really, 
I find that people have kind of chilled a little bit on the phone thing. Like, at least it shows, like, it, out of the gate, it was like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? It's so crazy. Everybody filming it, Instagramming it, all that. Yeah, and it doesn't, I don't find it distracting at all anymore. It's like, I, I think it kind of changed in tone a little bit. Yeah. If people are watching this, they'll see you have a million Michael Jackson buttons on your jean jacket. I have, yeah. I've actually had a couple of those in my life. Yeah. Um, why do you have so many Michael Jackson buttons? In? I don't know. I just, I bought these on eBay. It was like a lot of 300 Michael Jackson pins, which I had no idea of quantifying how many that was. And then like <laughs> three boxes showed up. And this was, all, these were all the ones I could do. But my son is really obsessed with Michael Jackson, like learns all the videos and stuff like that. Really? He's four. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. When you see him experience music, how do you feel? Um, It's cool. I mean, he's got a really unique vantage point on the whole thing um yeah i don't know particularly this new record he really lived with yeah, yeah. so did you intentionally search for michael jackson buttons or was that like the sixth thing you searched for he it was pretty funny i'm trying to remember the song it was like he was singing one of our songs we don't deserve love <laughs> and, I, and i was like where did you hear that he's like oh i heard it when i was going to bed like as we were recording the vocals in the house and wow. he was upstairs and he like knew, could repeat, sing the song based on hearing it from. That could be a trip too, asleep. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll have a very complicated relationship to the record when he's older and not know why. <laughs> this is, I don't want to hear this album yeah. ever again. Or, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe. What are you listening to now that's interesting you? Um, uh, not a lot of new stuff. I mean... I kind of like been on sort of a cumbia trip and a lot of Latin music. Um, I just, uh, we have a, a Haitian restaurant in Montreal called Agricole. Which is really and, great. And one of the waitresses, her dad was a um, big disco DJ in, in Montreal in the 70s and he was selling like his entire vinyl collection. And I bought it for like 300 bucks or something. And it's just like this infinite, like every 12 inch from 19, like what was playing in Quebec in 1977. But it's Dude. pretty amazing. I've just scratched the surface of it. It's going to take me like months just to go through it all. But I'm, I just last night was emailing, emailing with a guy in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, because he has his entire record collection for sale. And I'm driving down yeah. to pick it up. And it's a lot of it's like 60s and 70s stuff. Yeah. And then, yeah, well, that's, I suppose that's a really honest way to kind of dive into music. You wouldn't know what to search for otherwise. Yeah, I mean, you can find playlists of, you can, a lot of the old clubs and stuff, you can actually find playlists of what they were playing back then. It's kind of a cool way to, that's great, to find stuff. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, the interesting thing to me about DJing is like, it kind of made me appreciate what happens when it, music hits an amplifier, different sound systems, like it, from a production standpoint, you just hear stuff that you really don't hear on earbuds. You yeah. Know? It's like <laughs> the first time I heard like, even just like Dr. Dre in a, in a proper club system, I was like, what the fuck? That's what that sounds like. Yeah. You know, it's just like insane. Sounds so good. Does that right? affect how you make your records? There's a lot more bass on this record. I mean, if you listen yeah. to this record on a big sound system, even like a song like Good God Damn is like, has an absurd amount of bass on it if you listen to it in the right system. How do you get everybody in the band to, let me rephrase that, do you need to get everybody in the band on the same page? I mean, part of what makes a band interesting is that everyone has their own angle and different talents and different interests. And um, Yeah. I mean... Part of recording in New Orleans, it wasn't an attempt to get the band to like play New Orleans music, but it was just to, there's just something in the heat and the humidity and the like, you just play a little different mm -hmm. when it's hot than when it's cold. And this was felt like the music we were making wanted to be played somewhere hot and sweaty. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's definitely a buy-in for the band. It's like kind of annoying to have to fly somewhere to work on music, but... Did you have to lobby them? Um, no, I mean, enough time had passed. And it, to be honest, it was kind of an easy sell because like winter, everyone lives in Montreal and New York and it's like, come hang out somewhere tropical 
you know, a couple weeks here and there in the winter. Well, there's great music all around you. Yeah, I mean, um, and it kind of enables you to focus in and like you're not, you know, at least like for those couple weeks, you're like kind of really plugged in. That's kind of all you're doing. Yeah. Are there limits to what Arcade Fire can be? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's limits of taste, you know what I mean? It's like, that's the whole deal. It's like you can have a billion influences, but it's how you kind of put them together. It's really interesting. My brother was playing and uh, Richie were playing these original demos of the Velvet Underground's first record. Have you ever heard that stuff? Yeah, I have, yeah. It's amazing. It's just like a complete Dylan caricature. But like you hear a song like Waiting for the Man or whatever, and it just doesn't even sound like a very good song. Like even lyrically, it doesn't yeah. sound very good. And then once they found that thing that makes them the Velvet, Velvet Underground, like it changes the meaning of the words. Like the words don't even sound the same anymore. It's like the um, All Tomorrow's Parties, you know? Which like should the sound out of tune. It should sound out of tune. It makes no oh, sense. All Tomorrow's Parties. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it doesn't even sound like it means anything. Yeah. And then you put that music behind it and you're like, oh, is talking about a different type of party That's than right. I've been to as like a 15 year old in suburban Houston. And yeah. You're like, like I want to know what that party was. Like that party sounds crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so with you, so you have this arcade thing that you put on it on on your demos, your sounds. Yeah, I mean, it just goes. It just it just go, passes through everyone, and it's just it finds a different flavor and it, it, um, there's always a couple things that we just can't do that, that are, that it would be really great, but just don't quite fit, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. Are they, is it a specific thing you can't do or is it, is it a moving target? I don't know. It's just like, it's hard to put your finger on it. Like what makes you really excited about something and what, what other people might think is great, but you're like, well, take it or leave it. Do you yeah. have an anxiety about this, the career, on any level? What do you mean? Do you think, and I, do you think, I don't have the words today, I don't know what to say today, I don't know if I can, uh, what, what if I lose this, the, the muse, whatever that means, which is really just work ethic or craft. Yeah, I mean, it's more, it's more like the chemistry of a band that you can lose because yeah. it's like it really takes work because it's such a, it's so relational. And if um, we put a lot of work into that, you know what I mean? I think we're in a really good place right now. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely one of my goals for this year is to spend about like six times as much time writing as I do because it's like... Wow. You kind of get in these patterns of like recuperation. I mean, I don't know. You, it is, at the end of the day, you really just have to go to the office for a certain amount of time and just like put in the work. And and um, but yeah, I mean, also you have to have something real to sing about, which comes from life. So like that's always the balance. Like that's why it takes us four years to make a record. Mm -hmm. If you could just like turn up and bang it out, then. And the, the worst thing, which happens frequently, is you'll get music that's amazing and you get it at the wrong time when you don't have anything, have anything to say. Right. And then you're just trapped with this song that doesn't say anything. You know, we have, we have like probably 30 of those that right. are just like, that should just be like slam dunk arcade fire songs. Yeah. And they just came like at the wrong time. They came too soon. Or are they there melodies and riffs and things? Yeah, totally. And like, it's hard. That's what's hard. It's like taking a thing that you already put something into and then trying to pull out the part that was just gobbledygook and yeah. make it into something meaningful. That's actually really hard. So you have those songs floating around somewhere. Tons. Just like stupid, like almost too many to the point where it's like you're working on something you're like, oh, that's actually that, you know? <laughs> but like stuff that you remember from like, you know, 15 years ago, melodies and stuff like that. You're like, I just wish I could just forget all this crap and... Um, you're watching um, all this. I was thinking what you're, when you brought up your son, but you watch what's going on finally in Hollywood. People are coming down. Finally, women are coming forward. Think about all this stuff happening. 
when you're raising a kid in this environment and you're an, you're a musician, you're an artist, and you've obviously got a strong social justice core that runs through your band, I hear an awful lot about how in the entertainment business men need to, this is a men thing, which I get. Mm-hmm. When you look at it, your, your band is very positive, obviously. You look at where we're at as a culture and art. Is this a tipping point now? Do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, it feel like being in the U.S., the most comparable time that oh, I wasn't alive then, but it kind of feels like the Nixon, like, 69, 70 kind of moment in the U.S. A lot of this stuff is very cyclical. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I... It's hard to say, you know what I mean? It's like, it is really strange to be having this this really important conversation with like a president that's like literally been accused of rape. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like and, really And bragged about sexual yeah. assault. Yeah, it's really, it, it is really strange, but um, yeah, I don't know. We just keep our foot on the pedal? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, of the camp that the world is getting slightly better all the time, um, even though there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. But it, I think in general, yeah. it's uh, s- certainly like a lot better for a lot more people to be alive than it was 50 years ago True. on pretty much every level. Um, Are you afraid at shows ever? And I, I don't mean this about you, and I want to put negative shit out there, but I watched what happened in Vegas and I thought, does this change how people play shows outside? I mean, that's kind of what our band is there for is to, I mean, we played in Manchester after yeah. the big attack, it, which is actually, I was like holding back tears just energetically. The crowd was, it was so heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not even a little bit afraid of that kind of crap. I'm like, I'm just like, I'm not even, it's just not, I don't, I don't know what that dude's name was. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't like, know. I have no idea. Not, not. And Arcade Fire is there for moments. I don't know what else we're doing, you know. Um, yeah, we played that same venue um, a couple weeks ago in Vegas. Mm-hmm. Not the outdoor bit, but at Mandalay Bay. Yeah. Yeah. It's heavy. It's a bunch of, it's a lot of assholes in this world, you know. But actually, one of the things that I've been most proud about about Canada was when there was that attack on Parliament Hill. Yeah. And it's not like we didn't talk about it, but I just think that the way that the Canadians dealt with that was so admirable. Because if that happened in the U.S., we'd be talking about it for like a thousand years. Yeah. It'd be like whatever day, like I don't even remember what day it was, you know, it'd be like this extremely... Can you imagine, like if there was a terrorist attack like in D.C.? Yeah. You know, and I, I just thought that the way that... The shooting in the house, but, right? Yeah, but it's like a combination of the press, the way the press is yeah. in Canada and, and, and culturally, where it was just, it wasn't like brush it on the rug, but just gave it no power. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it has literally no power in society, which, yeah, I mean, I just, I think that's how it should be. You know, like, I don't think you should... Like if some guy like knife someone, I just don't think you should be famous or I don't think that you should give that kind of stuff power because it's like you're like so much more likely to get hit by a snowplow in Toronto. It's like, you know, it's like it's just insane to to like shape your society around these completely insignificant things, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree. Yeah.